you know, when I was at Tamarind and we had to sponge for the master printer, I was just like, why isn't everyone interested? And welcome to the 26th episode of Pine Copper Lime, the internet's number one printmaking podcast. I'm your host, Miranda Metcalf. I release an episode every two weeks, and on the off weeks, I publish an article on the Pine Copper Lime website, which features images and maybe a bit more information about the artist I'm going to interview. Print friends, my dear dear print friends. Do you realize that we have been at this for a year now? I have interviewed 26 artists from around the globe, and we have talked about love, failure, legacy, family, gender, immigration, creative process, witchcraft, print collecting, motherhood, death, God, Damien Hirst, robot porn, and the end of the universe. Having conversations with incredible printmakers has been my favorite thing, and sharing them with all of you has been nothing short of an absolute joy. Thank you so much to everyone who has listened, told a friend, shared a post, entered a giveaway, sent me a kind DM, become a Patreon member, left a review, or just given a simple fuck. Like anyone trying to create anything, there is nothing lonelier than feeling like you're shouting into the void. But I have never felt that with Pine Copper Lime. Printmakers, you have shown up, shown your love, and brought the community together in an incredible way to celebrate sharing stories and our love for this medium. Printmaking forever, shun the non-believers, join the party. And my friends, this week is just that. My chat with Peter Lancaster is a joyful romp through all the things that printmaking can be, culminating with Peter's new and exciting project, creating a print residency in his homeland of Fiji. I don't even want to say anything more about it. I just want you to sit back, relax, and prepare to join us on a tropical printmaking paradise with Peter Lancaster. Hi, Peter. How's it going? Hi, Miranda. How are you? It's good to finally make contact. I know. I know. I feel like we've yeah, so kind of been circling each other a little bit between like Australia and Fiji and timing wise and all of that. Yeah, well, we both had moves. Uh, you've made a move and I've made a move to Fiji and uh, that's been uh, quite an ordeal, but an exciting. <laughs> ordeal. Yeah, I guess I started. Um, I mean, it was a long a long road to um, getting here, but I did start. Uh, I, I, I had a very strong interest in drawing, mm-hmm. and um, I actually tried to get into a. There was a drawing course you could do in uh, in Melbourne, Australia, and um, I was determined to just you know just draw as as you know. I like you used to look at all the masters and set up uh, objective drawing and just draw all day, and then. I ended up not getting into this course. I was like, mm. and I was convinced I was going to get in. And then my <laughs> uh, my uh, senior lecturer said, "Oh, look, maybe you should try printmaking. You know, you can you do a bit of drawing drawing in that." I yeah. said, "Radio, I just <laughs> had no idea." <laughs> and and most of that time I was doing etching. And then near in third year, there was a there was a guy up the other end just drawing on these bloody big rocks and um, <laughs> and he was a fantastic drawer which was and then I just saw hey this guy's just drawing directly onto onto that surface like mm. and then it's going and then it's going onto the paper I said that's just like magic yeah well so from sort of third year I was just uh hooked I never looked back they I found though that I started just getting absolutely taken in by the um the challenge of things not necessarily going the way they should go that <laughs> I've seen or woodcut 
you know, and that chemistry side of things started to play its uh, play its way through the process, you know, depending on the temperature of the day and where the sun came in through the window and mm. all of these things. So, yeah, so uh, I, I eventually found that what became the Bible for me is that Tamarind book of lithography, which um, mm-hmm. I just used to read all day, all night and <laughs> highlight every, I think I ended up highlighting pretty much the whole book with a highlighter pen. <laughs> With uh, can kind of remember, and then challenging myself with um, with the skills and doing a postgraduate as well, and then yeah, and then um, I discovered in uh, the forward in the book about the Tamron course, and so I got some good um, some great references, and uh, from a woman who had actually done her masters at the University of New Mexico. Mm-hmm. Uh, her name being Kay Green, and she ended up being the sponger for um, Anne Trujan, who wrote the Tamarind book, and Clinton Adams. Clinton, I think, wrote it, and then Anne Trujan was the one who was doing a lot of the practical sort of demonstrations for the book. So she had some amazing um, sort of feedback and experience working for him. So, yeah, so she gave me a great reference, and um, I, I ended up doing the printer training program which was at that stage, um, I think it's now a year again, but it, they compacted that down into like a four-and-a-half-month course. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it was absolutely full on. It was, yeah. like, it was like I'd walked into military school or something. <laughs> I, was, I couldn't sleep. I just – everything was lithography, yeah. But that that is actually just – that was the training program before you went into the – the uh, next stage, you know, they chose two people to go into the mm-hmm. custom printing area and Bill Lagatuda was was then the master printer. So I actually didn't apply. I was just um, determined to get back and start a shop, you know. Mm-hmm. And I was still at that point a printmaking technician at a university in Melbourne. And then so I came back with these sort of extra skills and, did another, I think another year and a half or so as a technician and then I just decided to throw it in and people thought I was crazy you know, because I was on salary and yeah. And I just thought, but, you know, like we've just got to do this. Everyone's going to be doing it. It's just such an amazing process, mm. you know, like mm-hmm. you've got to start a shop, you know. <laughs> yeah. There was only like. One other place doing it then, um, the Victorian Print Workshop, it was called then, which is now the Australian Print Workshop. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure if you've visited there. Yeah, not yet, um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's that's a quite a big, that's a funded sort of uh, institution and that does, um, yeah, so it does etching, relief and lithography. They have a big offset press as well. When you decided to start your own shop, where where was that? Where did you start it? Well, that was in the folks' garage. <laughs> maybe where a few people start, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> uh, so and uh, and was old, that in was that in Melbourne or was that um, that was that was in Melbourne? Yeah. Mm-hmm, so yeah. Uh, so it was pretty make do, you know. Like I tried to you know extend it a bit. I didn't have great building skills back mm-hmm. then. And and then I got this uh, amazing hand-operated 3460 Takash press coming to crate, 1989 or? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that went into the garage and then because I was still the technician at that stage, it was kind of good. I had a salary coming in, but mm-hmm. um, also there were obviously art lecturers there and prints were selling a lot. So I kind of had these pretty well-established artists wanting to make lithographs, you know? So when you said that, like, prints were selling a lot, do you mean, like, the ones from your studio or just kind of in general the market was, like, a really no, good place yeah. for prints? Yeah, like, I just remember seeing, going to exhibitions and seeing five, six, seven red dots mm-hmm. going down under a lot of prints Yeah, in, a, in an exhibition. And it was super exciting and they were all handmade prints back then so it was exciting to print an edition of 
you know, I don't know, like I might 15 or 20 prints and and then go to the exhibition and quietly walk around <laughs> and see a lot of dots going up and being the quiet, you know, like a lot of printers are, just sort of quietly giving yourself a pat on the back in the background and mm-hmm. letting the uh, artists take all the, you know. <laughs> uh, but, all the glory, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's nice to hear that people not understanding what it, what they're actually looking at, what was behind it, but just loving the work for what it was, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The translation, the translation sort of worked. For me, that meant the trans- translation had worked into lithography, whether they be a sculptor or a painter or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. And at this time, did you did you have your own personal practice, or were you just you know focusing on the the art of collaborative printing? I did make a lot of prints. Um, they were not great prints, <laughs> but they were <laughs> they were they were as it sort of sort of started shifting to more more towards technique rather than you know, the actual image, you know, I said, what if I try this wash with, mm, mm-hmm. you know, I mixed beer, you know, you'd sort of kept searching for technical challenges, I guess, and mm-hmm. thinking, you know, look, if I can do this well, that's another thing I can offer artists with confidence. Right. You know, a good printer should be able to offer a whole range, a whole menu of options, you know, depending on their their work, their main discipline just trying to really um, entice them with, you know, the possible marks they can put down or washes or whatever. Yeah. So that's kind of how my practice ended up moving towards mm-hmm. my own practice. Yeah. And then so when you started your, your own workshop, what did you call it? Yeah, well, I was trying to think up some fancy sort of names and, you know, something that sounded really cool. and. Uh-huh. Yeah, it just ended up being Lancaster Press. <laughs> that's good, though. You, you know, you yeah. know, people know what they're getting, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so now we've just added on, you know, the Fiji bit, Lancaster Press Fiji. Right, and, right. Um, so, so how long were you in Melbourne for? I probably ran for about twenty-eight years or so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and. Um, I, I I grew up in Fiji till I was about twelve. Dad was a set up obstetrics um, in Suva, the capital. He set up the ward then. It's, it, it's obstetrics and gynaecology, and then training Fijian and Indian doctors. He was going to be there for two years, but he ended up staying for fifteen years. So <laughs> we ended up doing all our early schooling in Fiji, which. I sometimes think it had a bit of an influence of loving the practical side of printmaking because we we're all right. we we didn't we didn't have TV and every, uh, everything uh-huh. started by the seasons we had kite season and top season and marble season. Wait, what is what does that all were, mean? Yeah, so when you used to you know kite season, you would you would make your own kites out of thin tissue and bamboo and rice flour and used to they were very hard to fly and yeah used to have kite fights uh, <laughs> they used to crush glass and glue and put them on the cotton and they could then cut another person's kite cotton you know and then yeah. so there's kites floating through the through the air like <laughs> coming down so we'd all all the kids would just chase these kites, you know, and try and get them as where they were, if they landed. So you're running through villages and, you know, because there weren't any fences, you know, in Fiji. Everything was just, you know, one property joined to the next. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, sort of Melbourne suburbia. So, yeah. So, yeah, all these uh, Indian and Fijian guys just had these amazing skills, you know, with with all of these seasons and also just skills in general um, mm-hmm. growing up in the villages. You know, cutting open a coconut or climbing, climbing up a tree or those sort of things really sort of just sort of hung in there, I guess. And yeah. so I love sort of I just love the the practical side of or watching any printer or who's really skillful at it. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, or a cabinet maker or you know, I just I just find that. You know, you sort of look at it and you realise, you know, that's that person hasn't learnt that in a week. You know, that's years behind that. 
Yeah, I think that that's something that a lot of people in printmaking have that 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 little bit inside of them where watching something that's very technical done very well just never gets old. It's just yeah. endlessly beautiful yeah, and, it's and fascinating. Exciting. And when I've, because I do, I've done a lot of lecturing in the unis in Melbourne and, you know, so one was Victorian College of the Arts and the technician, who's a great lithographer as well, you know, we, we could just pick, we could just pick the students to just have it and we'd just both mm. look at each other and say, just nod our heads and, you know, <laughs> I mean, they had no idea, you know, but just in the way they sponged or, or the rolling, you know, like, and you just, and you'd say that person would be an amazing assistant. And over the years, I've probably had two or three fantastic assistants. But in the end, you realise, yeah, there's actually not many, you know, because it is, it is quite a special skill to have someone work alongside and, I guess, not look bored. <laughs> <laughs> when I was at Tamarind and we had to sponge for the master printer, I was just like, I was just, you know, every every role and every move they made, I was just like trying to take it all in, you know. Yeah. So, and then I realised, you know, why isn't everyone interested? <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I I definitely, as as part of what I've been doing with this podcast and everything, is really, you know, being a communicator for printmaking yeah. and 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 trying to be that person who can explain it and and bridge the gap. And it was a lot of what I did when I worked at the gallery as well, because people, it was a gallery that focused on printmaking and someone would come in off the street and they may not know what it is. And sometimes you would explain it to someone and they would just look at you blankly. And sometimes you explain it and just this light goes off and you're like, all right, you've got the gene, like you're going to be a lifer. <laughs> that's it, that's it. It's like, yeah, it's like cooking in an artist and you think, all right, yeah, they've, that's it, they're going to keep coming back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And it amazes me about some of those early, because I did love all the American greats, you know, the Rosenquists and mm. the sort of degrees and, and how, was it Margaret Lowenground, I think? who which had a shop in Long Island and she convinced some of these amazing artists to make mm. lithographs. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that that's that, you know, when you say like convinced to make lithographs, I think that's something that people would love to hear you speak to is that how does one go from saying, okay, I've got, I've got a press in my mom's garage or wherever to, to, to getting it really talented artist to come and work with you. How does that happen? I, I mean, I used to, you know, so I'd go to one of, you know, one of that particular artists that I liked. I'd go to their exhibition. By the end of this exhibition, I had the whole print made up in my head <laughs> of how I could see it, you know, how I could see the result. And uh, I just get so excited, and I'd get home and I'd write a letter. And, you know, back then it was, you know, it was all hand, sort of the the address was all handwritten and I'd send it off to the gallery and, you know, it would then get through to the artist and I'd, and I'd always uh, normally get a response and generally, mostly, those artists ended up coming around for a visit and and then I would have a stone all ready where with all ready to put some marks down and um, mm-hmm. the ones that generally, you know, uh, just uh, I think, Ken Tyler once said that, you know, a great artist will just make great prints, you know. It's pretty mm. sort of simple formula and mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's <laughs> often the case. Yeah, they could just um they they could just they as soon as they touched the stone, you know, they would just something would often happen, you know. Mm-hmm. When I worked yeah. at the gallery I would see that a couple of times where someone who might be a ceramicist that a print of theirs would come through and it, it would just be incredible and you'd get like, oh, no, this was the first litho they ever made. You know, you're just like, yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. No, it's, 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 it's really exciting and, you know, and that's part of the collaboration thing that's apart from the technical side is just, you know, pleasing, being able to please the artist because, um, you know, they can be, you know, their, worst, their own worst critics. So... Mm. Um, and it's not easy to just make a quick change, you know, look, you know, move that line over to there or, yeah, so 
you do uh, you do try and nurture them sort of into it and and you know and having each artist with a different personality you know and so you adapt to that but I guess I think artists gravitate towards certain printers in their personalities as well I get you know mm. you know for me I get attracted to certain sort of work because mm-hmm. I see what could uh, you know how it could translate yeah I think yeah. I at one point, um, Michael Kempson from Cicada Press was in Seattle where I was from and he was giving a talk about what they do. And I don't remember what it was, but some person in the audience asked a question and his response was like, well, the thing is at Cicada Press, we have a really strict no dickheads policy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was yeah. something about like, is it hard to work with, you know, artists? And it just was like, well, you know. <laughs> you can self-select a bit yeah (laughs) yeah I guess uh yeah I've had some doozies yeah which uh I've had to um struggle to get through but uh it's been because I've sort of been self-supporting I guess I've had to be less fussy sometimes um I don't sort of have funding or Mm -hmm. um so that the the um sessional lecturing is sort of got me through some tight spots but outside of that yeah I've just been reliant on the um on the collaborative sort of printing custom printing maybe the last five six years I've just found it becoming a real grind and um and the the lecturing work stopped and um so yeah it was just uh it was just becoming too too hard to maintain Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, well, that's when I started sort of that initial search around in Fiji. And, so yeah. um, so where did you end up in Fiji? I'd love to hear, you know, a, well, I really, I want to hear everything about where you are, but I have to like remind myself to start with some of the basics. So like, where are you located and how long have you been there? Um, I guess is a good place to, place to start. Well, when we lived here, we were in uh, Suva um, and um, we used to go for holidays uh, on the Coral Coast, it's called, on the main island on the west side. Um, and Kuratonga is the sort of area where we used to go for holidays. But we're in, uh, it's in a place called Malangarigari, which is hilarious because that in Fiji and in English that translates into rock. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of rock under the ground. There was this eight bedroom house that was uh, had squatters in there, and mm. it was, but it was actually just on, it was for sale on the real estate side. And so it was a delicate process with the squatters and getting them out. And we eventually, yeah, got got uh, to take hold of the property. And um, my wife and I have been sort of renovating it for the last two years um so it's probably about two you know two and a half three years so we've actually been getting it all ready yeah so it's it's sort of up on a hill and like it's a five you know you can see bits of the ocean in the distance and then in the other way you can look into the hills Mm. so it's quite a nice panoramic sort of outlook from the studio and it's actually a nice spot to sit and draw outside the studio so the studio i actually had added on so it was sort of a purpose-built studio I sort of sort of mapped it all out and measured out the presses in there and the benches and you know so it was a classic bench with two returning benches coming out with the presses in between mm-hmm. um, and yeah so the, the property already it was like a, it's about an acre and uh, it had a lot of big established trees, which was also great, sort of mango trees and uh, breadfruit, which is another sort of bready, sort of big round thing that you can make curries with and sort of chips and whatnot. Mm. Um, guava trees and, um, you know, lots of coconut trees. And so, you know, there's quite a bit you can just get off the property for, um, you know, when we have guests come and stay yeah. and sort of grating coconuts and drinking <laughs> coconuts and, yeah. and what's what's the weather like yeah it's like incredibly humid in uh you know sort of uh november december january february mm-hmm. um they're pretty 
you know, if you're sitting by a pool in a resort, it's kind of it's kind of fine. But as soon as you start doing any physical activity, like even writing a letter, you just start sweating. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, you either go with it and just get you know completely soaked, or you just sit still under a under a tree and you know and you jump in the pool all the time, you know. And yeah. The great thing is there's a wind, there's often a wind blowing through. So you jump in the pool and you the wind just sort of cools you down. So then you sort of, your temperature drops a bit and you kind of keep. But the, the, the studio's got, you know, air conditioning for when I'm printing. So it's actually, you know, and it's sort of insulated the roof. So it's actually quite comfortable for printing. Yeah, because I was I was going to ask about how the humidity works yeah. with the printing because I know that can be – that's definitely a factor. If it's climate controlled, that's like the best yeah. of both worlds then. Yeah, it seems to work. And the stones and the plates and so on, actually they seem – the surfaces stay wet for longer because it's not dry. It's a humid sort of climate. So you're not – you know, your stone doesn't sort of suddenly dry out, you know, like in a dry – like I remember that in Albuquerque, you know, like – and that dry heat that yeah. the stones would drop or just one roll to the next, it's suddenly, you know, you've got that dry roll thing happening. Yeah, so it's good. It's got, you know, it's got its sort of good and bad sides, but you know, it's not a it's not an issue really. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, and then so it's um it's pretty warm all year round though, or at least comfortable. Oh yeah, now so this time of the year at night you might have a blanket. At night, but during the day, it's just you know, t shirt and shorts, just uh, yeah, every day, yeah, and just a bit cooler at night. But I would, uh, you know, re- usually recommend people to come, you know, May, June, July, August sort of time is just fantastic, yeah. beautiful, yeah. beautiful. So, um, so what's tell me about the facilities, like how many presses and, and what kind, and just dive into all the, the the technical print stuff that I know people love to hear. So I bought the container over initially and um, just jam-packed it. And uh, I got in uh, my uh, 34, 60, that, sorry, that bed size, that 34-inch by 60-inch bed size, um, Takaj, mm-hmm. uh, electric one. And then I've got another hand-operated one, which is a Melbourne-made press, Melbourne Etching Supplies which um, VCA, Victorian College of the Arts, changed over all their presses, so they were getting rid of a few. So I kind of fixed that one all up and re-sprayed it, and, you know, that one works great as well. So I do the stones generally on the generally on the um, hand-operated, and I've got a big uh, slab on the um, electric, which I do all the ball-grained plates on. Mm-hmm. So the plates offer, you know, they're practical for, you know, an artist can take them back to wherever with them or people can work around somewhere on the property or, but with the stones, I've got a, I've got, I've got a, I've got a big stone there. I've got quite a few in Melbourne, which I'm slowly sort of getting them over here, but um, I've got, I've got stones to do 56, 76 size, Mm. which is that standard sort of large paper size. Yeah. I've got quite a few medium size, which will do 45, 60 sort of paper size. And then and then I've got a bunch. So if I, you know, if I thought if I did classes, I've got a bunch that will do that 28 by 38, which is sort of like a 56, 76 cut into four. Yeah, I've got a bunch that size. Then I managed to get over um, a photo exposure unit, a vacuum frame as well, and some positive plates and, developer and so on so there's 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 an option for that sort of for you know combining colors on some of the photo plates with the stones or the aluminium plates Mm -hmm. yeah so it's just sort of downsized a little bit uh (laughs) until you know i can get more i mean the plates the plates are fine for um larger you know large paper size so i the first yeah, I did work with a local artist who just dived in and did these five, six colour lithos and you know, and he just, you know, he just didn't hesitate. It was mm. just amazing. Yeah. yeah, there's just this huge 
big Fijian guy just covered in tattoos. <laughs> it's just it's such a presence, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, he just he just loved it. Tell us about like what uh, what you offer there. Are you doing regular workshops? Do you have residencies? Do you have like opportunities for groups to come? Tell us about like what what it offers. Yeah, well, this the house is big. It's got like four bedrooms, and we're trying to encourage uh, artists of you know any discipline because um, the studio is kind of you know things are on casters and things can be moved and you know so I kind of like the idea of artists coming to use it as a residency uh, and they could have family in tow or the first resident artist from Australia, Sue Anderson, she bought her family. They just went off and did stuff during the day and we just, you know, we made prints and then my wife and I went off for a while and had our own holiday and they just sort of had some downtime initially before getting into the studio stuff. So, um, yeah, it does allow, you know, for a larger group and also we kind of encourage, you know, we're trying to work out packages for just an artist who wants to come on their own as well, you know, mm-hmm. make a more sort of, uh, you know, f- to try and fit different budgets as well. It's sort of a bit of a learning curve to see or see what people are looking for and, you know, trying to customise to make it enticing for people, I guess. You know, every every printmaker I know anyway would love to organize a holiday around making prints like (laughs) yeah yeah i don't know that i've i've ever taken a vacation or (laughs) any kind of holiday that like wasn't print related in some way even you know even when i was working at a gallery it's like oh i have a couple weeks off i'll go to i'll go to chiang mai and go see you know cap studio and all the printmakers there and you know it's just like it's always been um such a way to good way to um get involved in a place you know like Uh, yeah 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 that's Uh, I mean it's so beautiful and so fortunate to be a printmaker because it's you show up anywhere in the world and you've got people if you can find a studio you can find your people yeah 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 that's it and immediately you sort of you know you're going off to an opening or Mm -hmm. you know that's something on yeah I did that in uh Brixton in England, I think I went to Artichoke Press, it was called, and I just took took everything with me and just started making lithos there, and it was just fantastic. Um, going on the tube each day and getting out there and, yeah, and yeah. doing stuff, talking to people, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's quite a – the property, you know, allows – there's a lot of uh, visual sort of information for landscape artists – just around the property itself, but there's a lot of great stuff just within a short drive, you know, like, um, and there's a lot of amazing stuff that's flots and jets and stuff on the beaches, and, you know, like, yeah, so I don't know, yeah, yeah some artists, uh, it would really suit them if they were that way inclined, you know, with their visual imagery. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of colour, you know and everything just grows you stick it in the ground and it grows you know like it's 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 a beautiful sort of vegetation jungly sort of to take in you know yeah but such a nice mix to be in the studio and rolling and looking out and you know these coconut trees are swaying (laughs) i just like shit you know this dream (laughs) dream actually came through because so much thought process before yeah. And it's quite um quite a special time because our folks just in the last dad passed away probably a month or oh, a few weeks ago. Mm. And then mum passed away twelve months before that. Yeah. So there's been a bit of toing and froing and then and now we've finally settled back and it's sort of, you know, it's kind of dad's dad being here that this is all kind of, you know, this is all resurfaced and you know, I've ended up back here and just luckily Dinah, my wife, likes it as well. <laughs> <laughs> the plan was in motion, you know, when I met her and then we got married like a year later and then I said, you know, gee, you know, sorry, but I really can't. I'm living in Fiji. 
<laughs> like su- surprise baby like <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah but she's she's done a lot of traveling and lived in other places so you know she was she was just she just loves it oh yeah. that's wonderful because so. it's how close is it to the equator yeah well it's pretty close because the sun goes down and one minute's light and then you know within five minutes it's dark you know, whereas in mm-hmm. Australia, you've got this long sort of evening, slow, slowly going into darkness. But because we're close to the equator, I'm not exactly how close. You don't get much uh, evening sort mm-hmm. of sunset time. Yeah. So you've got to have a quick gin and tonic before. Yeah. And then what about um, wildlife? Like, birds iguanas like what kind of things would you see if you if you were sitting on the porch uh drinking uh, your gin and tonic and in, in the evening yeah you'd sort of have well you turn you step on those cane toads a lot oh which is a, a bit of a surprise for some visitors um just because they hop around at night and if you're sort of walking around in a half light it's the you know they're sort of you sort of squash squash one of those. There's uh, mongoose, so which means there's no snakes. Nice. So mongoose, mongoose. I was going to say, like, yeah. that's not so nice that's, for the snakes, but it's nice for anyone who wants to go strolling in the evening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, not like the Australian bush, you know, like which is pretty freaky for, yeah. you know, seeing a <laughs> snake in the path in front of you. Yeah, so there's not, you know, there's like, there's not a lot of, there's sort of like quite a lot of bird life, like, you know, parrots and like more into the interior, mm-hmm. the island. But on round the coastal areas, there's not, you know, there's not a crazy amount of wildlife sort of, you know, there's not monkeys or whatever swinging around in trees. or um, It's more your sort of like little beetles and lizards and all that sort of stuff, you know, to sort of run across, you know, those geckos that run across your wall at night in your room. and <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a, there's the odd scream for from people who've new arrivals from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Diana had a daughter here with a few girls, and they were sort of had scream scream out now and again. Yeah, yeah, but there's plenty of plenty of stuff out in the ocean. Oh, I so bet we pretty much eat fish all the time, um, and you know, and pretty much all the cooking is you grate coconuts and squeeze out the juice and a lot of stuff gets cooked in coconut juice whether Mm -hmm. it be curries or more fijian food which is a lot of stuff out of the ground like dalo and cassava and they call it it's like heavy starchy sort of vegetable stuff Mm -hmm. and then a lot of green you know cabbagey stuff and so you can eat really well here but unfortunately you know um you know coca-cola and Mm. You no know, refined foods have all taken hold, like a lot of the Pacific Islands, and right. you know, sort of runs havoc with diabetes, and uh, yeah, which is you know, it's it's a real pity. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, how close are you? How close is the studio to the beach or to the ocean? Well, yeah, like I said, you know, you sit on the studio deck, and you can see. You know, through the trees, bits of ocean, just mm. there. And so it's just a meander. You can sort of walk down the hill and across the highway, which is the two lane highway, which is like sort of a back road in Australia. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but we generally just jump in the car and it's like a five minute drive down to a, you know, a nice beach. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's a, a, you know, like a, 25 minute drive there's a, just an absolutely stunning beach called Nutandola where we take guests and you know you get you sort of have massage and horse riding and surfing oh my gosh. and <laughs> walking and that's just a fantastic you know sort of half day oh, day that trip it's beautiful yeah. yeah yeah it's absolutely stunning yeah so what are you um what are you looking forward to like what's what's is there anything on the horizon that you two are particularly excited for yeah, well, I may, I may do a bit of that full circle and actually try and make a few dodgy prints again. Myself. 
Um, and like, I really, I am really keen to try and get, you know, artists to, to just come here, some good artists and, mm-hmm. and, you know, cause it is, it, we think it's a pretty amazing setup and, um, you know, like I said, we're just trying to make it so peak, I think especially around sort of Brisbane, Sydney, you know, those places are pretty close and, and then I think, you know, west side of the States, you know, would, mm-hmm. is not sort of that far. So I so said somehow, would, yeah, I'd, like, I'd love to try and spread the word on along that side and because, you know, it's a good stopover. I mean, Fiji Airways now goes um, direct to LA. Mm. So mm-hmm. it's kind of a good stopover. LA, Fiji, make some prints, then go to Australia, you know. Why the heck not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, the website, we only probably just got that finished only six weeks ago. Mm-hmm. So we've got a bunch of information on that, but we'll just sort of keep adding packages and, uh, you know, get feedback from, from artists that have, that have been here. Um, like there's one up there from the first artist that came. She put up a fantastic testimonial, so... Because it is, like I said, it is a thing you you, do, you don't want to sort of come and, you know, find that the whole thing's a bit of a disaster. So yeah, yeah. give as much flexibility for people as possible to sort of for their needs. So the website is a good place for people to find you. Do you guys have anything else? Are you on doing social media as well? Yeah, so there's uh, Peter Lancaster for Facebook and um those uh, links are both on the website. Mm-hmm. So that's just like um, the website's just lancasterpress.com.au. So people can, um, yeah, go ahead, sort of get, get an idea of the layout of the the studio and the, the, the accommodation. And it's kind of nice because, uh, you know, if an artist came with their family, family or a couple of other friends, they can – they can be self-sufficient, like, uh, you know, they can do their own cooking and they can go off to the market, which has, you know, fresh food sort of daily and gets, get get whatever's in season and, and then go off and do, you know, look around the area. There's sort of, you know, go into the interior to waterfalls or you can go out, outward and go snorkeling and diving and whatnot. And it's all, it's fairly well located for all that sort of stuff. It's kind of a nice place to just hang out because of the the, the the way that the layout of the sort of the house and the property. That yeah, we're just uh, yeah, it's just trying to um, we've sort of we we've had quite a few friends over, and that's you know it's good getting feedback from them, and um, because uh, the luckily the house was the the sort of initial layout was pretty good. We just had to cut out a few walls and open up a few areas, and and we put sort of. Um, doors in the fronts of the bedrooms and put decks so you know guests can sort of have their own little private deck and I guess it's only been the last sort of three to five months that things have really been finished and uh you know and I've tried out the presses and I've made some prints and so I kind of feel comfortable that everything's sort of working and you know there's a there's a place to grain stones and um you know the graining machine works and you know so just because and all the the power is the same as Australia, mm, the mm-hmm. 340 volt thing, which is a great thing. It just meant the press could be just plugged in and you know it was up and running. So just all that practical stuff, you know, there was a bit of stuff and getting the internet on and yeah. So the internet, the internet's great, which is which is really good. You know, it's really fast. So that's obviously a big requirement for people these days. Mm-hmm. Well, so, it, just, it just sounds like such an exciting time that like this amazing new studio and this amazing experience that you're offering people is just like just starting to like really blossom and 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 go somewhere. So it's it's so, so cool. And I, I hope that we can be a big part of, of sharing that. Yeah, well, I've just yeah, it's been fantastic. We've both been listening to your podcast. <laughs> Night with an earplug. Sometimes yeah. we don't quite make it to the end because we we fall asleep and then we restart. <laughs> yeah. I think that's but it's a... such a nice, soothing oh, program to listen to, you know, and listening just how different artists describe 
uh, passion, you know, for the yeah. process. Oh, yeah, thank it's such you. A, yeah, it's yeah. Such, a, such a nice discovery anyway. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've, I've loved making every episode and I'm super excited to, to share this one. It's great to know uh, that um, you, you've got involvement with Megalo as well because uh, I gave some lithography workshops there and I just love the community feel of that yeah. place. Yeah, they do that it so was, well. It's um, it, it, for, you know, uh, I think uh, one of the technicians left, John Hart, but mm -hmm. he, was just, he was just great to have around. Yeah. Well, yeah. Is there anything else you want to make sure people know before we sign off? It's you don't. It's hard to find a mentor in lithography, in lithography because yeah. there's not, not a lot of around. But um, I got onto um, Fred Jenis, who used to, uh, he's retired now, but he printed in um, Sydney, mm -hmm. uh, and he he printed in uh, New York for about 10 years with Erwin Hollander. Oh, okay. Who, who actually died, I think, in what, a year or a, in the last year, I think. Erwin Hollander is with 90-something. Mm. But I wrote to Fred and he invited me to his studio in um, in Glebe in, um, in uh, Sydney. And uh, he was just, he's such a modest guy. He's Dutch mm. and such oh. a modest guy. And it's fascinating to... Is he collaborated with all the greats like over there with Hollander doing these um, de Koonings and Rosenquists and wow. and uh, so and he just now and again he'd just come out with a story you know not just said oh yeah I remember when I worked with you know Helen Frankenthaler and <laughs> it was really hard work you know she made me do this you know I, I told her to go and get you know like. <laughs> It's just so, you know, and he's just, and he just looked, he was amazing to watch rolling the stone and, you know, he was just this wiry guy, you know, and just really charismatic and it was just such a buzz to go and work with him. Yeah. Yeah. And I learned, you know, I learned kind of almost more or really just fantastic tips off him that I didn't learn at Tamarind, you know. It was just mm -hmm. sort of from you know had a different style of etching stones and yeah he had a different style so when he was at Tamron right at the start they they got him in with another European printer just to see the difference between their style of printing and the Tamron style yeah and yeah. then I think he worked with Tyler for a while and then and then he ended up with Erwin Hollander yeah so yeah and then he then he worked as a printer for about 20 years in Australia working for, you know, you know, John Olson and mm. Brett Whiteley and all mm. of those guys, you know, when things were, again, everyone was selling lots of prints. Yeah. 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 So anyway, yeah, yeah. So that was, uh, was good to just get that in. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah, I'm glad you did because that's, um, I think that that, that mentorship yeah. is mm -hmm. so important and so huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Particularly yeah. with yeah. lithography, because you know, you can sweat over the Tamron Book of Litho all you yeah. want, and it, you can get pretty far with that, but there's nothing that replaces being in the studio with a master printer. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, look, there's just a couple of a couple of methods that you did that just, you know, really changed and quickened things up and made things work better and, you know, it's just fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Beautiful. Well, we'll keep, uh, keep in touch about, you know, your possible, you know, vacation times. and. Absolutely. Um, Thank you so much. I'm so glad this worked out and um, yeah. I'm excited to share your story and, and what you're doing and I'll just, be in touch as that kind of evolves so thanks so much Miranda it was great thank you Peter this was a real pleasure okay. talk to you soon okay, thank okay. You. Bye. Bye. bye well that's our show for this week join me again in two weeks time when my guest will be Annalise Gretovich we talk about her beautiful monumental woodcuts creating a sense of home as the daughter of Ukrainian refugees 
iconography, and the fabulous party which is Print Austin. This episode, like all episodes, was written and produced by me, Miranda Metcalf. And, like all episodes, I could not have done it without my incredible editor and incredible husband, Timothy Pauschak. And we could not have made this sound legit without the incredible music by our dear friend, Joshua Weber. I'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.